Poddo. Good morning, if it is morning, wherever you are. Welcome to the Ned Lad Radio Hour, your weekly dose of tech skepticism, cynicism, and realism. I'm Nick Hilton. Welcome. You've got mail. When you think of famous navigators, you probably think of Magellan, Vespucci, or Lewis and Clark. But in the internet era, the great navigators are the people behind user experience, UX design. On last week's episode, I spoke to Alex Hollander, who led the 2023 redesign of Wikipedia. We discussed some of the things that were important to that project, like ensuring the maximum ability of readers to process and digest knowledge. Wikipedia is a project governed by a simplicity of purpose, a comprehensive, free-to-consume, publicly edited encyclopedia. Anyway, I'd encourage you to listen to that interview if you're interested in what I just described. But the vast majority of the internet has a far muddier sense of itself. Overwhelmingly, things are a mix of commercial self-interest, prospective user uptake, and strange corporate imperatives. Today, I'm going to talk about one specific UX innovation, the infinite scroll. But first, a message from Ned. It's very short and just reads, open quote marks, design innovation has regressed the primary functions of the internet in its 40 years. Simplicity has been replaced by an insistent chaos, static by motion. The impact is to submerge users deeper in the drowning world of the web rather than push them closer to the surface. Close quote marks. This morning, upon waking, it's currently 7.50am as I type, but uh, 11 minutes past 9 as I now read it out, I lay in bed for the first half hour and scroll through Instagram reels. This isn't something I do very often, but it's a pursuit that people uh, around me uh, do quite a lot of. To be honest, I still predominantly use Instagram in the old school way, scrolling through my home screen of people's grid posts or watching their stories. Stories itself feels bafflingly new to me still. But then occasionally I remember the existence of reels and a few minutes later I'm sucked in. I'm served endless videos of dogs interspersed with memes about the foibles of heterosexual relationships. If there is an alternative algorithmic universe for my reels feed, I have not discovered it. I have learned that not all dogs can handle stairs and not all men can manage a diary. Instagram Reels is part of a suite of apps, the most popular apps of the present moment, which includes Twitter, or X if we're calling it that, and Chinese giant TikTok, governed by a UX principle called Infinite Scroll. Do you remember how there was a time in in architecture a couple of decades ago when you'd build your $20 million villa in the Hollywood Hills and just have a beautiful, formal, rectangular pool? And then suddenly any pool at any pricey mansion had to become an infinity pool. It had to give that sense of the pool's surface being unlimited in a perfect union with sky or sea. Well, unlimited is the word of the century. Infinite scroll is a tactic that was deployed predominantly to keep users on the app. Watch time became the most important metric for apps, and therefore they sought to avoid offering users the opportunity to switch off, to take a break. I'm sure that the internal self-justification involved attempting to give users a more frictionless experience, but the impact was clear. People kept scrolling until their fingers and brains were numb. I saw a graph this morning during my scroll, looking at the rise in average monthly hours spent per user on major apps between the years of 2018 and 2021. During that period, Instagram had modest growth from something like three hours a month to just under eight Facebook was pretty much plateaued at 16 hours a month, but appeared in decline. But there was one app bucking the trend, TikTok. During that period, the site went from an average use of about 5 hours a month to 25.7 hours a month. And that's just the average user, a figure that accounts for blokes like me who spend about 5 minutes a week on the platform to your terrifying teenage children. That takes the story up to 2021. But it also explains why all of these services have now integrated Infinite Scroll into their offering. They are chasing the tail of TikTok. Instagram Reels are by no means alone. Since Elon Musk took over Twitter and turned it into X, pivoting the focus increasingly to video, Infinite Scroll is ever more part of that service. There seem to be few questions being asked whether an average 
average user time on app of 95 minutes a day is a good thing, or, you know, putting our brains through a cheese grater. Infinite Scroll is here to stay, I'm sure. But there are also whisperings of a fight back against the ubiquity of this technique. Daily Wilhelm is a UX writer in the US and someone who has written about how we can stop the infinite scroll. That piece got a lot of pickup and suggests, just a whisper, that there is a counter feeling, a sense that maybe we should start to rethink our relationship with endless screen time. And I'd also recommend at this point tuning into an episode I did a couple of weeks ago with Joe Hollier from Lightphone, who's a dumb phone manufacturer. And we did a lot of stuff on this subject of whether screen time is something we should be pursuing as a sort of technological world. Anyway, you're about to hear me chat with Daly about all things Infinite Scroll. So stay tuned for that now. I am in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and it is 9 a.m. on the dot. 9 a.m. on the dot. We've started very punctually. And thank you for getting up uh, relatively early. I'm here in the future in London. It's 2 p.m. <laughs> so I came across a piece you wrote about Infinite Scroll. And Infinite Scroll is something that concerns me as a, as a user of technology. I, I fear it. I fear its addicting properties. But I wanted to start before we get to my moralizing about, about technology. <laughs> let, let's start by um, looking at how it came about. Can you, can you talk me through the development of Infinite Scroll and, and, and what it is exactly? So Infinite Scroll is probably something that we're all familiar with at this point. Most social media platforms, if not many other platforms, utilize it. Um, it was developed in about 2006 by um, a designer called uh, Azza Raskin, um, and he actually was at a uh, UX design firm at the time, and it was later refined by a man named uh, Paul Irish, and it was just a solution to pagination which I'm not sure if I'm saying correctly because I've only ever seen it written out. That, that sounds sounds right to me, but just define it for people who, who are not in the UX yeah. business. So pagination or maybe pagination will um, be more helpful um, is just the dividing up of web pages. So it's more seen on retail sites where you scroll through and at the bottom it has page one, page two, page three. Mm -hmm. So infinite scroll is the infinite version of that. There's no pages. It just keeps going. Okay. So it's basically the, the app based internet, at least that we basically all know and see nowadays, basically mm -hmm. everything uses it. Now I feel like this is completely, maybe completely wrong, but a while back in the earlier days of the internet, there was a sense that the core metric by which the success of a website or an app was measured was clicks, you know, how many how many times is this page loaded? How many is it refreshed? And it seems that Infinite Scroll sort of argues against those principles. Was there a change in the way that these things were measured that kind of made Infinite Scroll more appealing to websites and apps that were trying to harness advertiser revenue? Yeah, um, as user experience became more of a formalized study of more of a formalized um, way of uh, measuring the success of technology, um, the less clicks actually the better because clicks at this point are measured as like that's something someone has to consciously do. That's effort. Um, that's something that someone has to think about doing. And the less you can have someone think, the better. One of the main, I guess, textbooks for user experience that the uh, when you're first getting into the practice is a book called Don't Make Me Think. So the least amount of thought that actually goes into interaction, the better. Okay, Don't Make Me Think. A worrying headline. But you're, <laughs> you're, a, you're a UX, you do UX design. So you're I do. giving a brief um, and, and the client wants maximum. Is this about maximizing time on the, in the product? Essentially. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We live in an attention economy. So the longer someone's staring at something, the better, whether or not they're actually interacting in a meaningful way or just scrolling through that scrolling to the bottom, to the bottom that isn't there, perhaps. Uh, that's interaction and that's time given over to possible ads, to possible promoted content. So the more time spent there, ultimately, the more profit in the end. But if I'm an advertiser and I'm advertising on a service that has infinite scroll, the idea that you guys have designed this with the lack of active thinking, the lack of active thought as a kind of codified into the into the design. As an advertiser, I sort of want my users to be as engaged as possible. You know, I want them to be, you know, looking at this properly and thinking, oh, you know, I do want a Land Rover. I'm going to pay £40,000 for that today. Is the absence of thought a good thing for advertisers? 
Um, that's an interesting thought in itself. And perhaps it's more about almost the subliminal messaging of it, just having that appear as often as possible to get that thought into your head mm. so that when you are looking at um, new cars, you think, I saw that somewhere. I can't place it where. I haven't done my research yet necessarily, but I know I have that Land Rover on my mind. Right, right. I was complaining recently about the fact that I listened to the same advert for Apple's credit card on a podcast (laughs) about a thousand times. I don't even think I'm eligible for this Apple credit card. And I complained to someone being like, they're wasting their money in just serving it to me over and over again. But then they pointed out that, you know what, now you know what it is, you're talking about it. You know, that's all it is, is just reinforcing that brand. And I suppose the same thing is true with the infinite scroll. You just keep seeing it until it's in your head somehow. It's it's in there. Um, whether or not you invited it in, um, you maybe didn't consciously do so, but that's, I guess, the subliminal nature of it, yeah. And so were there kind of landmarks in the development of Infinite Scroll? I'm, I'm sort of assuming that this is something that has basically come out of the hegemony of social media as basically how we use the internet. Is this something that was pioneered by Facebook or Instagram, or am I looking at it all wrong? Um, No, absolutely. Um, I think um, Facebook was one of the early adopters because it worked so well um, with the chronological nature of the timeline, or at least what used to be the chronological nature of the Facebook timeline. So instead of eventually getting to the bottom and having to page through, um, you would essentially be able to keep scrolling into the past which is perhaps more um, interactive than it is thinking like, oh, I'm at the bottom of the page. You're at a natural stopping point. So when social media kind of came to the realization that there doesn't have to be a natural stopping point, that's when it got adopted moreover into Instagram, which is obviously also part of Facebook, but um, Twitter Tumblr for sure. I remember when eventually the pages went away on the bottom of there and that went my entire uh, high school career, basically. (laughs) And so if you were a, sorry, if you were a UX designer, you are a UX designer. There are some (laughs) clients who you would recommend presumably Infinite Scroll to. And there are some clients presumably where you would say, actually, Infinite Scroll is sort of maybe contrary to your um, needs or your requirements or it doesn't best serve your visitor. Who who are the kind of uh, people who are not being um, served by Infinite Scroll or is it just that it's taken over and everyone's everyone's now using it? No, there's definitely places where it doesn't make sense. Um, there's definitely places where I would argue against it. Um, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of retail still functions on pagination mm. so that um, because that is more of a conscious thing instead of infinitely scrolling through um, shirts or whatever you're looking to buy, um, you you want to be able to have a stopping point. You want to be able to be like, oh, I saw that on page two. I want to revisit that. Because with infinite scroll, it's very hard to A, find a stopping point and B, remember where you were. Um, because with pagination, you have landmarks, you have page numbers. Um, whereas with infinite scroll, I don't know how many times I've flicked my thumb in the last 20 minutes going down this page. I'm definitely not going to be able to find that content again. Yeah, yeah. No, I. it's always striking with Amazon how like you, you know, click through one, two, three, four, five, six, and then you can just back a few times and you're back mm-hmm. at the kind of the previous products. Whereas things I'm served on Instagram, I can never find them again. It's it's also te- it's terrible when you flick past something you actually wanted to see, and then you spe- you know can spend the rest of your day looking for it. Yeah. So so there's a big there's a clear divide between the retail impulse and the kind of social impulse. Would you say? Yeah. It it really is about um how much effort, how much consciousness the experience itself wants its users to have. And there's definitely places like with social media where that kind of mindlessness is encouraged. Whereas other things, they want you to be more mindful, like in retail experiences. Okay. So social media, then you've used the word mindlessness. And you've also (laughs) told me you've let the secret out that the UX designer gospel, the Bible is called um, don't think or something. Try not to make make me think. think. Yeah. Don't make me think. (laughs) Okay. So don't make me think was your principle. And we've arrived at a basically a major part of a core part of the internet that basically rewards mindlessness how do you kind of feel as as someone who does ux design ux for those who don't know is a shorthand for user experience is this something that enhances the user experience 
Uh, it, it depends on what the user wants to get out of the experience. Um, the thing with user experience is that we should always be advocating for the user. And that's something I mentioned very heavily in my piece is, you know, people over profit, even if the experience is ultimately more profitable, how is that actually treating the user in the end? Mm -hmm. And and there is something to be said. Sometimes we want to get lost in content. We want to keep scrolling you can format um, ebooks now in a way that it just you're constantly scrolling rather than flipping through pages. And for some people, that's a more frictionless experience um, that works better for them. But that said, um, as a whole, I think that um, infinite scroll is a detriment to users in many ways, as far as mental health goes, as far as productivity goes. I, I can't. Uh, sign off on it entirely in an ethical way. Yeah, uh, and I guess it comes back to that idea of measurement. How does an app like TikTok measure its success, its sort of cultural penetration? Is it simply by the amount of time that teenagers are spending on it? Because that's a kind of worrying way of measuring it, right? Mm -hmm. if, you, if your ultimate KPI is to keep people on the app, then you're sort of incentivized to come up with these things that are serving a master other than the user how can we deal with that then how can we how can we resolve some of the issues around technology addiction i don't want to use a, such a scaremongering term but you know <laughs> it, it does feel like it sometimes right the, yeah if, it, if it we has are, if, addictive qualities for sure yeah and you've got gen z or gen z as you call them and they're spending seven or eight hours a day on a single app that seems obviously bad but you know that's the, in the business interests of of TikTok, you know, is this just, am I just putting too much um, no, pressure on UX to resolve um, failures of the market? No, um, I think, I think part of it is it's often put on as a personal problem. If you're spending eight hours on TikTok, you know, that's on you. You need to get out and figure out your life. But uh, it should be said that these experiences are being made in a purposeful way that takes advantage of psychology and the way that the human mind works, the way that humans behave. There's a lot of research that goes into creating these experiences. It's not accidental that it's extremely addictive. It's uh, It turns into a time suck. Um, so I think that technologists, UX designers, um, developers, and certainly the C-suite, CEOs, and et cetera, um, need to be more mindful of that, of how things are affecting people because we, we do have um, some um, nascent research into uh, the effects of social media and it's not, it's not very positive. Mm. Um, and that's something I think that needs to be more paid attention to rather than the bottom line. There are uh, things to be said for embedded in TikTok. There's like a digital well-being um, function that allows you to limit your screen time. Is that advertised straight up to these teenagers that are spending eight hours? Maybe not, but it is there, which is just kind of a, I don't know, a baby step in the right direction. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it, when we're at the point of be asking TikTok to sort of um, solve this problem for us, we've probably reached the end of the line. But I, I just wonder <laughs> whether, you know, there's a generation of UX designers who, 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 pioneered this transition from pagination to infinite scroll and that was you know it is a move that has kind of re reshaped the way that we use social media and i think that probably corresponds to the development of you know early days of facebook the idea of the wall the idea of it actually being a genuine way of reenacting your real life social maneuvering on mm -hmm. the web and now it's much more of a thing about sort of discovery and a sort of you know almost an alternative to real life um mm -hmm. and so those are you know, those are natural currents is there now a generation of ux designers who are working on something even more than infinite scroll what's the next level i mean infinite scroll is sort of suggests that it r will reach infinity it doesn't necessarily mean there's something beyond it but there must you know if we know technology there's something beyond it what, what are the kind of currents in ux that you think could pioneer the next well technology? ideally i hope it would actually be a step back toward pagination for both its 
technical um, issues. Um, there's there's many um, accessibility issues involving Infinite Scroll, as well as um, the kind of ethical, psychological, uh, social problems that I mentioned before. So I would I would hope that we would be able to find more of a happy medium between Infinite Scroll and pagination. You know, something like a load more button at the end. It can be as right. simple as that because it just creates that natural stopping point. Let's, but, let's just let, just before you move on though let me cycle back because otherwise i'll forget to ask about the accessibility issues just give me the headlines of what are the accessibility issues with with this infinite scroll yeah report. um so infinite scroll is not optimized for screen readers it's not um optimized for accessibility technologies um that will only be able to see the first page, quote unquote, of content. So once you read a, reach a certain point, there's nothing beyond that. Um, mm-hmm. So even though you have all this content continuing onward for many screen readers, it's just going to be that first bit, which I imagine is very annoying, um, as well as um, for SEO purposes, for search engine optimization, it can't go past those first couple pages. It's just going to see that content. It's not going to be able to log that into a search engine. So that content's going to be even more difficult to find in the end. Um, it's it's not ideal. It's not optimized quite yet. Okay. So now moving back forward, you've, you've said maybe we'll regress and sort of go back to something closer to the internet as it was, I don't know, 15 years ago. Do you think that's realistic i mean is it more likely that with the yeah (laughs) okay is it more likely that with the advancements in terms of ai and um i don't know even apple's sort of headset thing that we're actually going to look at just a much more integrated generalized ux invading our real world more yeah the goal is terrifying idea more likely (laughs) Unfortunately, um, maybe. Um, I, I'm pretty cynical about what will happen first before perhaps um, more policy changes are implemented. I know that in America, it's um, kind of the Wild West. Europe has more limits on what technology is allowed to do. And I think things will change as people um, become more educated about the way that technology functions. But that said, I think that the goal is is frictionlessness. It's um, seamlessly integrating into our everyday lives. So the more it can, uh, to use a scary word, infiltrate, the more it will. So, I mean, with AI, that might mean even if there's not content to be found, even if there's not user-generated content, it might generate that anyway just to keep mm. you in the feed. Mm. Yeah, I'm still kind of coming to terms with, you know, the little squiggly line on Microsoft Word that comes when you make a typo. I sort of think of that as sort of AI sort of telling me what to do. But I suspect that actually the reality is that my entire experience of the internet is going to involve squiggly lines and sort of add-ons and extensions telling me what to do and when to do it. Um, Oh, yeah. There's there's whole conversations to be had there for sure, because um, AI is uh, even more wild than the West of America. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. So, so just as a final thought, then is there is there a um, this may be like beyond the bounds of what you what you write about, but is there a regulatory solution to this? Is there is this something where you actually believe that um, policymakers, rather than who deal with many of the harmful elements of the internet and who are wanting to tackle harmful elements in the UK, we're seeing a lot of that at the moment, where they say actually, you know what? Evidentially, children having a screen time of ten hours often that's probably bad for their mental health and for their physical Mm -hmm. health is there a regulatory pathway that you foresee or is there just no appetite from within the tech industry for that and if there's no appetite within the tech industry it's very hard for governments to lead on this yes it's it's harder to see within the tech industry itself i don't think that there's any um there's there's no motivation to do that because profit is the motivation so unfortunately um taking care of people is a back burner thing. Um, I I think that it's unfortunately going to be a slower process um, and tech is always infinitely faster than policy. So I think it's going to be more of a situation of people that have grown up with this. Um, So maybe Gen Z, when they are reaching adulthood, reaching voting ages are like, hey, this messed up my childhood significantly. And I don't want that to happen to more children. So we need to do something on 
a policy level on a much larger scale because um, there's there's no intrinsic motivation for the tech industry, for Zuckerberg, for Musk, um, et cetera, to do something about it. Well, on that note, uh, <laughs> happy thank you note. For, <laughs> on that happy note, thank you for joining me all the way from, from Michigan. The Ned Ludd Radio Hour is a Pado podcast written and presented by me, Nick Hilton. The theme music is Internet Song by Apes of the State, used with their generous permission. The artwork is by Tom Humberston. For socials, go to nedluddlives.com and spread the word there. You can also leave us a rating, or leave me, I mean, it seems, us seems quite grandiose. Leave me a rating and review at Spotify or Apple or wherever you're listening it to be honest with you. it probably has a rating review function anyway till next week cheerio party and that's why it all let you outside oh god